and which was composed of 18 chapters within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us, O Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows. The milker is the cowherd boy Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. People of purified intellect are the drinkers. The milk is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent and the crippled cross Okay, continuing from the beautiful discussion yesterday about Swadharma. The individual duty and how to recognize the individual duty and how to be in alignment with it. So now after that, um, beautiful discourse. Arjuna has a question. And this is where we pick it up. Arjuna asked Sri Krishna, what force is it that drags us into sin even against our will as if by some compulsion? Um, so the word sin is used again and it's helpful to touch that definition. Sin means separation from God. So... Um, Again, what's been shared is that whatever we do, rooted in the concept of separation, rooted in the idea or the feeling of being separate, so I do for myself, little self, which is apart from the Lord, apart from, not a part of. <laughs> Doesn't mean that. Separate from. When I'm in that place, then what I'm doing is against the flow, not with the flow, as it were, leads us to suffering. That's what the Lord's working with us on. So Tommy T adds a short, beautiful commentary. He says, what drags people into committing sin? Though they don't want to do such things, still unwillingly they are dragged into it. Is there some force behind it, he asks. Often we come across this in our lives. We don't want to do certain things. We even know that it's terribly wrong. But still some force seems to be pushing us. Go ahead and get it. It's all right. And so no wonder Arjuna asked Krishna, what is this? Mm. Good question. <laughs> um, so... And pick up here. The blessed Lord said, Know that the enemy here on earth is personal desire and anger, which arise from the all consuming rajasic guna or the restless quality of nature. Know that the enemy here is personal desire and anger. The Blessed Lord says, it's nothing but personal desire. You're wanting it. You're wanting it. Your desire overpowers your intelligent discrimination. It's a fight between your lower selfish desire and clear thinking. Such desire is caused by rajas. It's all consuming. We've had this experience, right? It's all consuming. Mm. And it's the cause of sin. And so Swamiji paraphrases. He quotes Lord Krishna and says, Remember, this is your deadliest enemy. 
how my deadliest enemy is within my own persona, within my own character, within my own thoughts, within my own mind. says Krishna, selfish desire and the wrath that comes out of it. When you don't get it, you get angry. Both the desire and the wrath are caused by rajas. So it's a beautiful, um, we haven't read it for a while, one evening soon. Beautiful discourse essay in uh, Bliss Divine on anger. And, and Swami Sivananda equates Desire, personal desire, and anger. It says they're the same. Two sides of the same coin. And, and this is the, and we've looked at this before, and this is the idea of what he's sharing, is that when we want a thing for ourselves, and my God, um, we've talked about, and some of us have been present for these discussions, sometimes in the silent workshops. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh shares a concept with us of original fear, the first fear in this body, which is this right after the, the birth when the cord separation. is separated. Yes. And, uh, and we experience this overwhelming desire to breathe and the fear rooted in the knowing that if we don't breathe, we die. And that's as it were. And then what's our situation? Our situation is that our lungs are full of fluid. And they're full of the amniotic fluid. So um, that's really our first in this birth. You know, when we ask, why do we forget? <laughs> in this birth, that's our first real experience of separation. And, and that personal desire is so strong, right? And that personal desire is so strong. I need, I need, I need. Um, and that feeling, that bhava, is still here as long as we imagine ourselves to be separate. <laughs> as long as we're still caught up in this. So when we look at these desires, sometimes it's so completely overwhelming. Right? There's this subliminal, if I don't have that, if I don't have this person, if I don't have this thing, if, if I'm not treated a certain way, then I'll die. Sometimes we experience it this way, right? So, and we talk about desire and, and, <laughs> and is there beneficial desire? Yeah, of course there's beneficial desire. Um, and there are even beneficial personal desires, which have to do with growth, which have to do with, with practices that help support us in our growth, in our upliftment. And those are relatively beneficial. Those two we'll want to let go of once we've... So we want to learn how to breathe properly in order why, in order to have vitality about life, in order to be of service in order to live a beneficial life. So we can say that wanting to learn how to breathe properly is a beneficial mm. desire. It's also a personal desire, mm. but it's leading towards something higher. Mm. But of course, once you've learned how to breathe properly, you'll let go of it. You'll naturally let go of the desire, right? So he's not speaking of the, of the chain of desires up. He's speaking of these self-centered, desires for fulfillment through the pleasures or avoidance of pains. I heard something nice on that sort of line, which we had talked about so many times and then it hit me, was that um, when the Buddha went for six years, he was going to get his doctor's degree because he knew that without his doctor's degree, he wouldn't be able to be a doctor and help people come out of suffering. So right. he knew that he had to go find how to be a doctor so that he could be the doctor. Home. Without that, he would have had nothing. Home. But he knew that that was the purpose to get the doctor's degree is to be the yeah. doctor. <laughs> so if that's really it, then you would see that that's not a personal desire at all. Yeah, right. um, so motives. 
the way we look when we're confused inside about whether some things a self-centered desire or not. We look at the we look at the motive. For what purpose do we want this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, Swamiji. Oh. Uh, um, I really um, resonate when it was said that where do these uh, come from? Where does this turning away, this separation, this going to the dark comes from? And it comes from Thomas, the gunas. The gunas is inherent in this particular, you know, equipment. It, it, there is no way of escaping. Of course it has to be that way. And to know that it's inherent and always available to, to move through them, with them, the three gunas, and to find the way to let them go. It's always there. So every time I turn away from the light, when I recognize it, it isn't about bad me, how could I have done that again? Mm-hmm. It's about that's part of this embodiment and now I I have the the grace to choose. Um, 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 so the thing about the gunas is that you are not them. So it is a force of nature. Um, it is a force of nature. So this body is propelled as it were by the by the forces of nature. This mind even is propelled by the forces of nature, but you are neither the body nor the mind, and we'll always keep coming back to this, to this point. Um, so he's not, when he speaks about sin, he's not judging us. This is, this Western concept of sin that we get labeled with is a really tough one to deal with. Because <laughs> that's not what's here. <laughs> That's not what's here. The the Lord from compassion is helping us to see how to come out of suffering. This is it. (laughs) So it's not a judgment. It's not saying you're terrible. It's not. It's saying, my dear child, this is what's causing your suffering. So, So listen to me, follow me, and I'll lead you out of it. This is the way it's being shared, really. So, and and honestly, we shouldn't fall into judging anyone for for their actions. No one for their actions, because also, if we really truly understand what's being shared and how to come out of it, then of course we'll step out of it. Of course we will. It's like stepping from the from the scary shadows into the light. Of course we will. Um, we, we've been, as it were, burdened with this terrible fear of death from that earliest experience that we've forgotten about. And so, and it's stuck with us. And there's something wanting to protect us Oh that is that is as of the nature of smoke, shade. Yesterday in the yesterday in the Upanishads, the concept shared with this in Katha Upanishad was shade, right? Light and shade, light and shade. So and here fire and smoke. In fact, the next sutra will pick up lovely commentary from Swami and Kitesh. 38 and 39, like fire covered by smoke, like a mirror covered by dust, like the unborn fetus completely surrounded by a membrane, just so is the wisdom in humankind covered by the insatiable fire of desire, the constant enemy of the wise. Personal desire. Again, not, we tried to clarify on desire, own breath. Should we be willing to give up our very lives instead of fulfilling personal desires? So as an example, if there's a morsel of food and it's me and a stranger, should I say, no, you take it 
and I will give up my life. You'll find your life that way. <laughs> okay. mm. <laughs> soul. There are many, many stories of exactly that where life was found. Right. I mean, there's a story you've told that's been passed on, so that I'm familiar with, but it oh. seems like such a sacrifice to say I will die. And I know, I know, and it and so it takes some dawning of some wisdom to get to that point. <laughs> so in other words, we can never give up enough of ourselves, right? You can always give more and more. There's no self-damaging, correct? I mean, is it, I'm taking a, a step forward in my thinking, but could you, is there a limit to how much you can give? Can you damage yourself by being too giving? The saints will tell us no. <laughs> <laughs> so I that whatever, whatever we give, the, the, you know, dear Peace Pilgrim would say, I'm plugged in. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mother Teresa is the beautiful teacher of that. <laughs> so, how much can the Lord give is a question. Because even the urge to give is, is, a, is a virtue of the Lord. So we have the same capacity, unlimited giving? We're not separate. And we don't give. It's the Lord giving through through us, through us. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to know what, what limit there is when we're in that baba. Mm. And there's not even a feeling in that baba that we're the ones giving. By the way. Um, it's a question of what is life, and this is where the Lord is leading us. You know. um, so here's the, here's the commentary on these two shlokas. As fire is enveloped by smoke, as a mirror by dust, just rereading the, the two, as a mirror by dust and as an embryo by the amnion, so is the wisdom enveloped by that desire. The saying, guru's inside, right? The wisdom is inside. And everything's inside. The kingdom's inside. Not different than the other teachers, is it? The kingdom's inside. So what is it that's preventing my access to the kingdom? Ego. The smoke. Yes. Like smoke. Inside. Like smoke. Yes. Oh, Arjuna, wisdom is enveloped by this constant enemy of the wise in the form of desire, which is as unappeasable as fire. Right, the desires can never be appeased. Oh my god, I lived that one. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and then we'll hear this voice that says, Yeah, but this next one will do it. <laughs> This will be the last one. Then I'll let you be. <laughs> it's like eating a bag. <laughs> they say in NA, one's too many and a thousand's never enough. A thousand's never enough. Oh. So here's the commentary. And he starts on this point of desire. By desire is meant selfish desire, which is neither natural to life, nor the uncaused desire for God, which is unaccompanied, excuse me, which is accompanied by wisdom and unselfishness, and which naturally leads to its own extinction in God realization. I'll read that one more time. It's uh, quite prescient. By desire, what is meant is selfish desire, which is neither natural to life. So and he gives the example here of such as the desire for food. To have a desire for sustenance is natural to life. Huh. Nor selfish desire is said not to be, nor the uncaused desire for God. So the desire for God, he's saying, is uncaused. It doesn't have a cause, the desire for God. 
that it's also a natural desire. Oh. Um, and then he says, which is accompanied by wisdom, this desire for God, which is accompanied by wisdom and unselfishness, and which naturally leads to its own extinction in God realization. Like Tommy Permanent is saying, the last desire is a desire to be free of desires. Yeah, that's like in the Mokshutta. Oh. But it's naturally extinguished in the realization. Desire and anger, hatred, are two sides of the same coin, he says. So will you naturally have some sort of sliver of personal desire all the way up until the moment of enlightenment? Because then isn't that the definition? Oh, there's a there's a funny one. So there's some point at which you don't have desires, but the but the but the person will still have some, perhaps. Hmm. But then there's the question of whether of what to do. But they don't affect the intellect anymore. No, once you've turned away from the shade to the light, once the intellect is turned away, and once it is steady, once it is committed and steady and, and, and will not go the other way, then a the, then the desire will be seen to arise and then dissipate. Yes. And there will be a feeling within the person of wanting this or wanting that. Um, but also there's a, there's a wholesomeness that comes within the person in this, in this process. Because the, those desires will, will often arise and assert, but there seems to be a knowing even within the personage that it's not beneficial. Mm-hmm. And then like a a falling away in a, in a sigh. <laughs> yeah. Like that. So, so you don't need, it reminds me of the master saying you don't need to accept or reject it. So it just kind of arises and then you don't have any, you don't have to play with it anymore. Because that's what happens with, with me in my life. It's like a desire will arise and I have to, you know, talk to it. I have to say, no, no. And then there's this other side of me and it's just like this whole dialogue. You have to use the tool. Change yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It that's seems true. like that's all I want is just that rest of being that's true. Ah. That's true. But it doesn't uh-huh. stop. And yet, the, cho- off, and yet the choices that you make um, are always crafting the nature of the reactive mind. Mm-hmm. So when you fall and make the choice to follow that, that whatever that is, when that choice is made, then yeah. then the tendency to do it becomes stronger yeah. again. Definitely. And so you see it, you see that the tendency becomes stronger and that actually will help you to assert more strongly yeah. as long as you're committed. You see the suffering um, again. Oh. So Swamiji continues on this commentary. He says, smoke hides fire and brings about darkness where there should be light. Similarly, desire envelops wisdom and brings about evil where there should be divinity. The mirror is hidden by dust and cannot function. Similarly, desire nullifies wisdom and puts it out of commission. Even the wise man under the influence of desire is unable to see his own face. Hence, our life is a song of regrets and remorse. But there is one saving feature. Desire encloses wisdom, but is unable to overwhelm it, dissolve it, or even dilute it. Just as the amnion envelops the fetus in the womb, but the child is not adversely affected by it. It is possible to fan the flame to dispel, to dispel smoke, It is possible for the child to be delivered untainted by the amnion. Even so, it is possible for wisdom to be fanned by right living and by right meditation. It is possible to to wipe desire off of wisdom. There's an interesting visualization if you can see it. If you can see it as as smoke or dust on the mirror, then you can wipe it off. (laughs) Uh, the mirror, here, the pure light, 
So you can't see the pure light. We're always dealing with reflected light. Mm -hmm. If you're looking in the mirror and the mirror is dusty, then the light will be diffused. If you wipe the mirror, you'll see it. So in this way, if you wipe off the personal desire from the wisdom, then the wisdom alone remains. There's a line in the uh, Hanuman's lakes, I wipe the mirror of my mind with the pollen dust of holy gurus. That's it. That's it. That's exactly the concept that's being dealt with here. Exactly the concept. No. So, so to make you for devotional service is really a remedy. Yes. That's it. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what's being prescribed here. Um, and then, possible uh, is possible in samadhi, perfect absorption of the mind, to deliver wisdom from the clutches of desire and to enjoy divine communion. So to deliver wisdom from the clutches of that personal desire. Mm. And then he closes with this. He says, desire to be desireless is indeed desirable. <laughs> yeah, desirable? Yeah, I remember what reading that. Jagger, Dave. <laughs> desire to be desireless is indeed desirable, but it can be deceptive, hence the need for utmost vigilance and even more God's grace. Mm. Any question? Any other questions, comments? It's interesting because okay. some of this stuff isn't even that individualized, or maybe it is, but because if you have a life partner, a business partner, you get swept up in their <laughs> needs too. So even yes. though you want to be desireless, if they have an element of greed and desire, then you have a conflict and you're trying to and you're just trying to give. The the only way we would is in the is in the um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. But that's I me mine coming in. Mm -hmm. I me mine. So, um, really, we all get swept up by the same thing. We're all experiencing the the wisdom being covered by this personal desire. So that's the human experience. When we take birth in this human body, this is we're coming into this. Um, Truly, everything is divine. Everything is essentially divine. Um, but within each of us, within each of us, the experience we have is this divinity being veiled or covered. Um, this is where we get to the... <laughs> if we want to be of aid, if we want to be of benefit, and we recognize what's covering my access to wisdom, and we deal with that, um, then we can be of benefit to those who are also suffering from the same, from the same disease. Can I share an example? That sure, please. Illustrate the point? please. So I want to charge our customers less. Yes. My business partner is the majority partner. He wants to charge them more. So we move forward and we charge them more because ultimately it's his decision. So now I live in this world where I don't feel as just as I would like because we're hurting our clients by charging so much. And I, I don't feel peace with that. I want them to have more value. So we're going down this path that I don't want to be part of. Uh -huh. So how do you have peace in that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability to focus on Ensuring that that uh, that whatever is offered to the customer um, is really an offering. Yes, I could do that. I could focus on over delivering. I could turn my energies elsewhere. It's not just about the money; it's about the value. There, there are solutions. I understand. Oh. Um, you know, we're not in control of our external circumstances. We're barely in control of the internal. <laughs> And this is the discussion. This is the question Arjuna asked. Why do I keep losing myself? What, what is this overwhelming? We're barely in control of the internal. But, but he keeps guiding us that we do have the ability to, to take control of the internal. Um, but the external circumstances are also God, by the way. Um, 
whatever happens to you um, is something being given to you from love, from compassion, in order to help you to be free. So it's a teaching, it's a trial, it's a test, it's an opportunity. It's a question of how we look at it, but if you change the angle of view, you'll see that. You'll see it's an opportunity. So this is the situation. I can't change the external situation. So what am I able to do with it in order to make this an offering to the Lord for the benefit of all? And that process will lead you to an internal dialogue that will be helpful. Um, and experience says that, that as you're able to do that, the external circumstance begins to change also. So it, nothing here is actually anyone else's fault. Whatever's being done, we've been here over the last week. The Lord says, I am the doer. Right? Who's doing here? Whose hands are these? So what we can do is, is work with our own intent, our own motive, our own desires, our own thoughts, we can set the direction of our life and we can set sail on the, on the sea to chart that course and nothing else will stop us from doing that. Nothing else will interrupt us. Everything will be an aid to us. Um, I shared the, over the weekend the banana story again and I, and I was reminded once again that every time I would pick up a banana that, that was not ripe or overripe, in other words, difficult, <laughs> that would be an aid to my practice. <laughs> and so too, it's, it's the case with everything that happens to us in the world. The more difficult experiences are the ones that are really great. <laughs> Because they're the ones that, that force us to stop, to let go of our assumptions, mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to face them in a new way, to connect to God for guidance, right? So those are the ones that are actually forcing us to do what we want to be doing all of the time. And then, so it seems like it must be grace. <laughs> oh. Okay, we should close. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. A beautiful question. Peace Pilgrim would uh, would answer that. She would deal. She would talk with lawyers and accountants and all of this, and and uh, they would talk of the same thing. I'm suffering, you know, terribly. I hate my job. I hate. And the guidance would be, well. Turn it around and put the and put the and put the customer first. Um, and this is what you're actually inspired to do. So, but some of that customer delivery is in your hands, and some of it's not. So let what's not in your hands not be in your hands. Leave it with the Lord, because that's who it's with. And then whatever you have the ability to deal with, then you do it. And that that will no doubt inspire. Oh, okay, we should close and find prayers in there too. Page 174. Om Om Triambakam Lord, by Rukami of Abandonan, Rejoy Mokshiam on Rizad, Om Triumph of Kamyajama Hicks, Randim Pushti Vaganam, Lord, by Rukami of Abandonan, Rejoy Mokshiam on Rizad, 
ஜயம்பிஜாமே சுகந்தி புஷ்டிவாஜனம் ஓகமேவ Adorable Lord, mercy and love, let us abide in thee forever and ever. Humble our sacred Rishi of Nanda Manjiki. And salutations to all the saints and sages of all traditions. Jai. Short, I should keep some.